This episode is brought to you by Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit helping build and donate homes to injured post 9-11 veterans. Visit HFOTUSA.org for more information. From the earliest man tying stones to clubs all the way to landing on the moon and nuclear weapons, science and defense have gone hand in hand. With that in mind, it looks like the moon is open for business once more. And this time, it's not about who's first, but who's going to last. Moon bases, space exploration and extraterrestrial colonization is both a call to science and a call to defense. This is Military Matters. Sometimes we put a book on our personal reading list and don't get around to reading it like we want it to. Recently for me, that book was Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. Now, one reason this book kept getting pushed to the back of my reading list was the title, Accessory to War. Uh, it, it didn't sit well with me. It felt a bit accusatory, like somehow astrophysicists were being compelled against their will to help build up the military industrial complex. But it was the author that kept bringing me back and made me give this book its fair shot. Turns out that Accessory to War was hardly an accusation, but an historical account of the agreements, both spoken and unspoken, between science and that very military industrial complex. The author that brought me back to this book was none other than world-renowned astrophysicist Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who co-wrote that book with his longtime editor, Avis Lang. Now, if the name Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't ring some type of bell, then I would encourage you to hit pause and give the name a quick Google search. Dr. Tyson is a podcaster, public speaker, educator, and even an actor having appeared in documentaries, specials, and even a few feature-length films such as his brief cameo in Batman v Superman, where he plays himself in a world where Superman exists. And in his brief role, Dr. Tyson offers his own perspective on what that means, a world where Superman exists. His cameo only lasts a few seconds, but what he says is applicable to the topic of this very episode. He says, quote, We're talking about a being whose very existence challenges our own priority in the universe. He's talking about Superman, of course. He then goes on to illustrate how Copernicus changed the world's perspective by removing the Earth from the center of the universe and replacing it with the sun. And the Earth, as now a bit player, along with the other planets and moons, are now moving around this sun in orbit. But then he goes on to tie that into Darwinian evolution, stating that in a world where Superman exists, that we find ourselves in a position where, quote, we're not special on this earth. We're just one among many other life forms. End quote. So what does Superman have to do with the book written by Dr. Tyson five years ago? Well, it has to do with our, and by our, I mean humanity's relationship with science. To really understand where we're going as a country with the world's most formidable military force, it's important to understand how those two things come together to push mankind to the limits of exploration. With all the talks of UAPs or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena on Capitol Hill, it feels almost inevitable that we will find ourselves once again rewriting our place in the universe. And even if we don't find little green men, gray men, or supermen, we will find ourselves neighbors to our fellow man. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and I talk accessory to war, the new moon race with China, and what lessons learned over the last couple of thousand years of humanity. What lessons will we take to the stars? Tell me about when you were writing this book, Accessory to War, looking back on it, you know, several years later, where are we in the intersection between defense and science? Is this bond link? Is this bond become strengthened, weaker? Where do you feel we're at? Oh, it's always been there and it's still here. And I don't see why it would ever go away. 
when you consider that a physicist is an expert, if I were to, if I were to distill what a physicist does, a physicist is an expert in matter, motion, and energy. That's what we do. That's all we do. How do they interact? How do they manifest? How do they formed? How do they dissipate? How do they, how can they be magnified? All of this. And a military operation, again, if I may distill it into one sentence, and I think if you think about it, that this is true, all right? It's, I have energy over here and I want to put it over there. I don't know any military operation that isn't that. Okay. I have energy over here and it could be a bullet. All right. The bullet has gunpowder or whatever is the propulsive uh, material. And I have it over here and I want to put it over there. So as long as the military is involved in moving energy from one place to another, and the physicist is an expert in matter, motion, and energy. Oh, and by the way, the astrophysicist, because the title of that book was The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. Where do we come in? We're just humble folks at the mountaintop waiting for photons to come to us from the stars of what possible use could we be to the military. And then you park the curtains and you realize, oh my gosh. Most of the history of military conflict had to involve navigation, precise targeting. Where is the thing? When is it that what my people, my astrophysicists, are experts in the night sky and its relationship to where you would see it on Earth? That laid out the first coordinate system, longitude, all of this. So there were no conquering of countries and then returning to the same place on Earth <laughs> without an astronomer right on deck with you, all right, or at least the tables that they provided for you, or at least somebody using the sextant to who's looking at the sun, moon, and stars to tell you where you are on this planet, okay? Just for context, Captain Cook, right? Uh, he went on a scientific mission, ostensibly, to the South Pacific to observe what was called a transit of Venus, Um Every now and then, every couple hundred years, Venus, the 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 sight line between us and the sun will be crossed by Venus. It orbits the, the sun closer than we do. And if you measure that precisely, you can get the scale of things and the size of things in the solar system. Okay, so it's a very important scientific measurement. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay. By the way, this, this is the Brits, all right? Hail Britannia, Britannia rules, all right, the, the waves, all right, let's, let's, let's unpack this. So here, Captain Cook, here are new scientific tools to measure this, uh, uh, this, this event in the sky. Oh, and by the way, we have some improvements in navigation, take those along with you, and map every coastline you see. Okay. Take a look at the timelines in history, okay? Take a look at when he observed that Venus transit. It was in the uh, 1780s, 1790s, something like, somewhere in the late 1700s. Then look at how quickly England took control over all manner of island states in the area, including when they started shipping prisoners to Australia. To this day, many of those flags still have the Union Jack on it. It's because of Captain Cook and his ability to measure, and his, he was empowered by the navigators, who were fundamentally astronomers of the day, to accurately map so that you can return. Now you give all those maps to the next set of folks who come in with the, with the waves of conquerors, basically. So uh, the, whole, the whole history of hegemony where you're going to have influence over lands that are not contiguous to yourself was enabled by this. And so that's the, the, that's the deeper history. In modern times, I care about the entire electromagnetic spectrum, not just light that you can see. I care about infrared and ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays. Stuff in the universe talks to me in those wavelengths. Wait a minute, you're the military. 
Somebody told me you're interested in multispectral imaging of targets. Oh, well, we're kind of working on the same thing, aren't we? You want to compare notes? You're probably better funded than I am. So you might make discoveries that that uh, that I will wouldn't make for another 10 years or 20 years. Or I might have people like smarter than you have because I we're, we're just pure academics and we do this for the love of knowledge. And so we might publish a paper that you that you might have to classify. All right. Uh, because it's of national security interest, because we discovered a new algorithm or a new detection um, utility. And so uh, it's um, this is my long answer to your very straight question. Yes, the science is relevant. Yes, astrophysics is relevant, not because we build bombs or inform how bombs are built the way a physicist would, but because we are experts in targeting and acquisition, in detecting really dim things. We're, we're experts in all kinds of overlapping. So it's a, it's a two-way street. Yeah, there's more traffic that we receive than we send, but it's still a two-way street. It's a two-way street with two lanes coming towards us, one lane going back to you. You mentioned the quantum. That's another tool for the technologist. And um, I don't see quantum bombs or anything. We're already in into the nucleus of the atom. I don't see the quantum as something that can be weaponized in the sense that we've already weaponized the atom. But it, in terms of IT, and yes, code breaking and this sort of thing, yes, that's a whole other frontier. You mentioned Cook. Cook and as an astronomer are able to map everything out, and this gives the Brits the ability to do a lot of expansion very quickly and assert that theater dominance. Looking at the future, where are we going that that you feel is the next leap between astrophysics, the Defense Department, looking out into the stars? What is that next big thing? I, I, the military has known this for decades, uh, I, and so I'm just I'm, I'm re repeating it, but I also agree. So I get to I'll talk about it further if you'd like that the next sort of sphere of operations, if you will, to use, uh, I guess, World War II technology uh, uh, lingo, the next sphere of operations is cislunar space. So cislunar is all space between basically Earth's atmosphere, and because the Air Force is pretty much has that taken care of, Earth's, the upper part, part of Earth's atmosphere and the orbit of the moon, that's cislunar space. That's the new high ground. And so we have to know what that means. What kind of a threat does it pose, if it poses any threat at all, all right? Any good military operations, you want them, or, or uh, military intelligence, you're not there to establish that something is a threat. You want to know if it can be a threat at all. And if it's not, then you can reallocate your resources. So it's, it's knowing not only if something's dangerous, but if something's peaceful, all right? And and all of that is is intel, basically. So uh, this cislunar space as the new high ground, um, it, it's got you thinking, do you need a base station on the moon to establish this, okay? And my read of the progress of geopolitics in recent decades, it's very simple. It's very simple, all right? We were last on the moon in 1972. Did we stay? No. By the way, we had Apollo 18 ready to fly. All right. But no, we cut the, but Nixon cuts the budget. Well, why? Oh, well, Russia is not really going to the moon. Excuse me, the Soviet Union. And so that's kind of why we went to the moon in the first place. Excuse me, it's not kind of why. It is why. It is why. It's not kind of why. We, we, we as Americans, we, we've cleansed that error in our memory of ourselves and we say oh we went to the moon because we're explorers and we're discoverers and we're americans and it's like really really no let's go back let's rewind go back to may 25th 1962 right six weeks after yuri gagarin just went into orbit launched by the soviet union kennedy calls a joint addresses a joint session of congress you only do that when something important is going down, okay? He's, he's talking about the launch. And wouldn't utter his name, Yuri Gagarin, 
But he says, and I paraphrase, if the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. Then he said, oh, let's go to the moon. <laughs> that, that was like after, all right? And so once he laid down the military motive for not getting our ass handed to us by the Russians, the moon became a fundable step to take, to demonstrate that we are the path the world should take and not the path of the godless commies, which was the subtext of that whole uh, that whole mood. Because the Russians, they beat us at practically everything. They had the first artificial satellite. They had the first non-human mammal, a dog, Laika. They had the first human. They had the first woman. They had the first black person who was a dark-skinned Cuban. All right. Remember, Cuba was part of that part of their world. And we are reacting to this. And so we took the ultimate reaction and said, let's go to the moon. And so we, when we got to the moon, we said, we win. When in fact, they had beaten us at practically every other metric of, of advances in space. All right. Now we find out they're not going to the moon, 1972. So the Apollo program is canceled. Further evidence that we didn't go there for science or exploration, the science piggybacked the geopolitics. So we did get some science done, but that's not what drove it. Let's be honest with ourselves. All right. We could have stayed there. We didn't. Uh, did we go back in 1980? No. 1990? No. 2000? No. 2010? No. Oh, now we're going back with the Artemis mission. Oh, it's great. I pour over all of the pages in the NASA website. Well, the time has come. We, we, we need to do this. We need to do that. And nowhere does it say China says they're sending astronauts to the moon. Can't find it anywhere. I looked in the NASA pages. And so, all right. <laughs> Am I the only, only one making this connection? That a flame, we started feeling a flame on under our rear end. Our ear started heating up and we say, you know, maybe we should redo, let's do this. And so, yes. And by the way, the mission to the moon was canceled. It was put in um, before Obama, uh, Bush, then Obama canceled it. Then it came back under Trump and it's still there under Biden. And it looks like it's there to stay, by the way. So we're going back to the moon it, 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 with a civilian space agency, but it's a way of saying... Yeah, this is cis lunar space, and we still know how to be there. In the same way, the Cook mission was not military, per se. It was an expedition, an exploration expedition. But it had military consequences. So this is us trying to reclaim cis lunar space for whatever value it may have in the future, even a value that we might not foresee today. So the Chinese are going up there first. That prompts us to go, hey, wait a minute. We need to get back in the space race. These guys are going up there. We That's not acceptable. Uh, near peer competition. But then the question arises, well, why are they going in the first place? Why? What's there? Why is that space between us and the moon so important tactically? I don't know that you always know in advance what would become a tactical advantage or not. Um the, the, <laughs> if I could use a pop culture reference, uh, do you remember the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where, where America finally obtains the Ark and it's delivered to the government and the final scene of the movie is that it's stored away in some place will never be found again. So we don't know. I don't want to read too much into the storyline of a fictionalized story, but Hitler wanted the Ark. We don't fully know what he was going to do with it. We don't know why. There's rumors that it could level enemies that you presented in front of him. So we want it. And when we obtained it, now we know he doesn't have it. That's strategic. That's totally strategic actions on the part of a, of a government. Or, uh, uh, and so uh, baseball teams do it as you near the playoffs. If it looks like you're going to have to go against a team that has a really good player and there's a trading season, you might buy that player 
denying that other team that player. So now if you face that team in the playoffs, they don't have that player to go against you. So, I mean, there are many layers of decision-making here about what this would mean. So, no, it's not obvious to me why cislunar space would be strategic when everything that matters is kind of down here on Earth, right? And and uh, so I, I don't, I couldn't tell you, maybe there's deep rooms where people have thought this through in, in think tanks, but uh, th- there's a, another frontier, like who owns the moon? If China puts a flag there and puts 22 flags and we only can muster one, uh, you know, on a return, uh, will they say, we own the moon, we just put up our flag. By the way, is that anything different from what the Europeans did throughout the entire era of colonization when Columbus went to the New World, sent by Isabella and King Ferdinand? Did, did the Queen say, oh, Chris, when you come back, give us a slideshow of the natives and the and the plants? And no, it was like, here, here's a satchel of flags. Plant them in the name of Spain wherever you land. That is the MO of ex- that what that was centuries of MO of exploration. So should we be surprised or shocked if China says we want to go to the moon to own the moon? I haven't heard them say that, but um for us to say to be shocked by that? No, don't be shocked. Just read history. You mentioned about the relationship between science, a scientist and uh, the, the Defense Department where, sci- you know, you guys have, like you said, you have the brain power, but you're often underfunded to make those brain power visions come to life. Whereas the DOD, plenty of money, just sometimes not the right direction or they're just not sure how to get there. You look at the moon situation that you just brought up. <laughs> and moon situation. <laughs> the moon. I, want, that's, I, I, know, that's I love the that phrase. The, <laughs> the moon situation. The moon situation. I love it. And, and 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 you guys, the scientists, are tasked with, okay, DOD says, hey, we need to get up there ASAP, but we need to do it better than we did before. We need to be able to establish presence. Great. When it comes to explaining this to American taxpayers who might think of this, and, and this is especially coming off of the COVID wake, right, where people became very upset and critical of science because it was politicized. People used medicine and science to push their own political agendas. People became very skeptical. Um, it's happened you, since climate we, change, by the way. It, 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 yes, 100%. Climate change politics predates even that, yes. And, and how do we how how does science explain to the public and especially folks like you who are in the pop science culture intersection between you and the public? How do you tell them, guys, this is worth the investment? You once talked about the value of a dollar and how what percentage of that dollar goes to NASA for space exploration and how it's almost negligible, but but critically important. Is that the same argument we give to the American public? We tell them, hey, we want to build a moon base because we're not sure what the value might be of in the future. It could pay off and might not. How do we explain that? Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to defend a frontier investment of money on the grounds that you already know how it will help you if that frontier is kind of out there, right? Literally and intellectually and figuratively and literally. So it's almost impossible. What you have to do is give past examples of where it has helped at a time when people might have doubted that it would have ever helped. So that's what I've done. I give and I gave the example with um quantum physics um where where you know this is the centennial of the discovery of the basic tenets of quantum physics. And if we were if you were around back then you might be criticizing the money invested in the labs and the particle accelerators. Say, so why are you wasting money on on atoms? You can't even see an atom. What do you care about? I'm a woodworker. I just care that my wood atoms cut, right? And 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 what yet 40 years later, 50 years later, the information technology revolution would be founded on quantum principles. There is no creation. There is no creation, storage, and retrieval of information without some exploitation of the quantum. And so 
you can't imagine a world today without computers. It's unthinkable. Yet no one had computers, not on their desk before 1990, not really, and not that just go back to and go back to the 1920s. So I give examples such as that so that people will, uh, and if I'm pushed, I'll give this example. You ready? I'll say, we're all in a cave, right? And then the, the youngins uh, go to the cave door and they open up the cave. They, they, I don't, does the cave door have hinges? I don't know. But they open the cave door and it they look now. out. And, uh, it does now. Thank you. And and, and they see, uh, you know, uh, hillsides and trees and fruit growing on trees. And they, they wouldn't have a word for the fruit, but because they've never been out there before. And, and streams. And they go to the elders, the cave elders in this tribe. And they say, we want to go out and explore. And the elders caucus. And they come back and say, I'm sorry. We have cave problems that we need to solve first before you go out. <laughs> and that, that I try not to give that example because it's it's very denigrating of people who are well-meaning, but it's you can't that that the lesson in that little that little parable, I think cannot be ignored that we're on this tiny earth and there's the whole rest of the universe to believe that not exploring is in your best interest uh, is to think that the cave has all your answers and anything else outside of the cave can wait. Now, how much, yes, the taxpayers have to spend money, but right now it's, it's hardly any money and it hasn't been much money for decades. So the space station, the, the, the Hubble telescope, the James Webb telescope, the astronauts, all of that is four tenths of one penny on your tax dollar. So you have people pointing to it and saying, why are we spending money there when we have problems here on earth? And I'm saying, how much money do you think we're spending there? Really? And I say, how much? And they say, well, 10%. But <laughs> they're always off by many factors. And so I, I wanted to, I joked that I wanted to start a movement where, where government agencies were budgeted how much money people thought they were getting. <laughs> <laughs> and if that were the case, NASA's budget would go up by a factor of 10 easily. We'd be on the moon uh, now. Yeah. So if we're going to make a base, it'll probably be a NASA driven base, which is not itself military. But what's the term in the military? It's a uh, uh, projected force. There's a term. What is it where you uh, listeners will know what I'm talking about, where your very presence is enough to de to deter aggression. And your presence doesn't have to be with weapons and things. It can be, you know, like if you visited, if you were ancient and you visited ancient Rome and you came from the hillside and you saw the city of Rome and statues and, and the Colosseum, you just saw that. It's like, do you really want to invade this culture? <laughs> That's not going to work. Okay. Look what they can do when they're not fighting a war, you know? So, so uh, if we set up a moon base and by the way, Make it a peaceful moon base and invite Chinese scientists there. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, famous for many quotes, one of them is, do we not defeat our enemies by making them our friends? Homes for Our Troops, HFOT, is a publicly funded nonprofit organization that builds and donates specially adapted custom homes nationwide for severely injured post 9-11 veterans to enable them to rebuild their lives. These homes restore some of the freedom and independence our veterans sacrifice while defending our country. Nearly 90 cents out of every dollar spent has gone directly to supporting our veterans and enabling them to rebuild their lives. Visit hfotusa.org, that's hfotusa.org to learn more. So speaking of quotes, Mark Twain said, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat itself necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm totally misquoting him here, but along those lines, it doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I've always appreciated that because it doesn't necessarily repeat itself. We don't we're not going to see the rise of another Hitler or Nazi party necessarily, but we would probably see something along those lines that rhymes with ideologies of 
we're better than them and so on. That's an interesting, um, we're looking, an interesting quote. Yeah, I, I'm not, uh, it's very insightful. Yes. Mm hmm. I love that quote. And and I think it's more applicable in this conversation because we're talking about history. We're talking about Cook. We're talking about Columbus. We've talked about how, you know, people, the, the, the exploration that became colonization, that became warfare, that became genocide, that became uh, enslavement and, and all these horrible things that happened. We are about to go into the next phase of exploration. Now we're leaving Earth. And we're leaving Earth with this history. We 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 have these lessons now. The question is, are we going to apply those lessons towards the future as we colonize planets, as we colonize comets and and asteroids and all these wonderful things out there? Um, do you feel, or how do you feel about the ethical considerations? between science and defense as we engage in these new forms of exploration. So the ethics, by the way, uh, just to make it clear, you can have, you know, dove scientists and hawk scientists, you can have both, but you, n there's little to no precedent for a hawk scientist rising to power and then invoking all their scientific know-how to lay waste to an enemy. That's not how that happens. Um, scientists are generally just trying to discover how nature works, right? Then you bring in engineers that can turn a scientific principle into a weapon to weaponize the science. The point is, in that command chain, somewhere in there is a geopolitical force hiring scientists for this purpose. So it's rare that, it, because scientists, we all speak the same, I speak the same language as Chinese scientists, as, as Ukrainian scientists, as Russian scientists. We all speak the same language. And you don't tend to find scientists leading other scientists into battle against scientists, right? This is not how that works. Because scientists, because of what we are, have fewer dis differences between us than practically any other pair of people in the world. Maybe musicians, music folks can relate. Just think about that. Uh, cultural dimensions tend to might be a little less um, tribalized, all right? Once they're, they share their their interests. Uh, uh, just a quick example there. I was on a White House commission that went around the world looking at the 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 climate for aerospace, the aerospace industry, it would, the health of that industry was, was lagging in the United States. We wanted to see, do we boost it with federal assistance? Do we let it fade away and just buy planes from other countries, Airbus, whatever? Um, cause it affected our military, um, our, our defense, our commerce and our, and our transportation, just civilian transportation. Anyhow, we visit star city in Moscow. We visited many cities around the world. We visit Star City. These Star City is like Houston, all right. That's 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 where they they that's the, the center of space exploration for uh, outside of Moscow. And I don't know the Cyrillic alphabet. I don't speak Russian. I don't, you know. And the the director comes out, and it's ten in the morning. He pulls out some vodka. <laughs> I never forget that. It's like, dude. <laughs> I don't even really much like vodka, and now you want to give it to me at 10 in the morning? But I don't want to cause a geopolitical incident by declining the vodka. So so we're all there, and we're sipping the vodka, and we just talk about space. And I had a camaraderie with that man and others in that environment that I did not have with our counterparts in England, in France, in Belgium, in Japan, in China. And I realized we, yes, there was the Cold War, but there was this subtext there. We were going into space. That was our bond. And I, I just felt closer because of that bond. And I thought to myself, well, aren't I supposed to hate this guy? This is like, again, the godless Russian commie. Uh, we're supposed to, well, I was told I was supposed to hate him. But wait a minute, this guy's into exploration and science and math, and so am I. So, 
So it may be that science and other kinds of discoveries of the natural universe could serve as the greatest unifying force there ever was among nations going forward. I know that sounds very pie in the sky, but do you remember that picture of the the photograph of the black hole that made headlines a couple uh, like a year ago or so, just coming out of COVID? There's a. Do you realize there's like a hundred institutions internationally that participated in creating that photograph? And you read the list, and in one of my public talks, it's a, it's a scroll, and you you know. Do you see the first few? Okay, it's a collaboration. It keeps going. And at some point, your jaw drops open. And you realize this is the entire world here. All manner of corporations and and and, and business interests and, and people who make machines and, and academia and all of this. So, uh, so uh, getting back to the crux of your question, is space a contested place? in the future will we learn any lessons from the past i think there are lessons to be learned that can bring about a peace what is the greatest act of a soldier is to lay down their weapons this is a famous quote the ultimate act of a soldier is to let because no more wars need be fought okay now let me offer a bit of cynicism here i read the 1967 space treaty all right this was <clears throat> this was written at a time where you know the United States and Soviet Union were going into space. It was a new frontier. The UN says maybe we should, you know, maybe we should uh, say something about this. You read the tweet; it reads like, "Oh my God, kumbaya!" I'll be all holding hands, and and no matter what's on Earth, if there's an astronaut in trouble, you will sit, go do all you can to save the astronaut, and you will combine forces and tools, and it's very wishful thinking. And I thought to myself, only when I got older and a little more cynical, and I said, "Really?" So we, there are new rules of engagement for space that don't actually apply here on Earth, but because it's space, it should apply. So wait, so you are you really saying that, well, on Earth, we will kill each other because we're born on a different side of a line in the sand or because we worship different gods or because we sleep with different people or because our skin reflects sunlight at different levels? Yeah, we'll kill each other for that. Oh, but in space, all will be fine? My rebuttal to that, I'm not rebuttal, my response to that is, if we are capable of that level of peace in space, then we ought to be capable of that level of peace down here on Earth. And we have yet to exhibit that. And until we exhibit that here on Earth, you have not convinced me that humans will be anything other than greedy, hegemonistic, warmongering humans in space, the way we have been ever since we've had civilization. Well... My understanding is in space, no one can hear you hate. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's what all the name calling doesn't work, right? Doesn't you just work. see the you just see the head bobbing up and down with the mouth and no sounds coming out. Yeah, that, that I think that, he's that, saying he agrees with us. We're good. I, I, I agree. Um, I'm going to craft some kind of tweet that that captures that. That'll be good. That'll be I, good. Please do. I, I'd love to be mm -hmm. part of that. Um, it, it, the last couple of minutes here. What do you want folks in the military, especially service members, green suitors from the private to the general? What do you want us to know about the intersection between what you do and what we do? Um, I think the military already knows this. That's why you have DARPA. And by the way, DARPA as a model has been duplicated elsewhere, as you may know. Um, the Department of Energy has ARPA E now, uh, and the E is for energy. They're trying to find innovative, you know, high risk but high return uh, investments in energy ideas. Um, so, no, the science has always been there. I think you guys know that. One one issue, and I I encountered this when I served on the board of the Pentagon. I was on the for several years the Defense uh, Innovation Board which was the newest of the boards that tried to make sure that 
you know, the, the military stays nimble and stays connected with the innovations that we all take for granted out here in with the Googles and the Apples and the and um, these companies that are and even the smaller companies that are innovating tomorrow's tech. The military doesn't always have access to that because you don't have all the brains in the world. You, you only have some of the brains and other brains are discovering other things. And it's not necessarily under um, under military contract. So uh, with with security clearance. So uh, that that board, we. We did a couple of things, one of the prouder things that we did is uh, there are people who are there on a sort of an IT track. All right. But there was not a path for them to be sort of rewarded for that. All right. Because what happens if you work hard, you bust your ass, you develop code that that is essential to a, 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 a missile system or some some other important part of military operations. And then you get it patted on the back. And so I haven't checked on this on the latest on this because I'm the, the I, I'm no longer on that board. But the goal was you'd go in there and you would advance in rank according to your achievements in that. And that no, that's no different from going in as a medical doctor, okay, or going in at, as part of the 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 legal profession, okay. You can be you can advance a, a, as an attorney and as a medical doctor in military ranks, but you could not as a, as a tech geek. All right. And so if you did, and there are people who love their country and want to serve their country, they'd be able to stay and not just get disillusioned and say, I, the, the no more rewards here. Okay. Cause the, <laughs> you should, maybe the time has come to stop measuring people's value to the military by how many pushups they can do <laughs> because my geek people are not handing you pushups. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel like you are you you don't know it yet, but you are a friend of the warrant officer corps because in the army, the army, the Marine Corps and the Navy, we have what's called a warrant officer. I am a warrant officer and we are technical subject matter experts. That's what nice. we do. Nice. Okay. And I feel like what you just described is the very core of warrant officers. You would be like a CW five, honest to God, like you'd be the oh, astrophysicist God. guy like. <laughs> Hey, that's Chief Tyson. Like the five star general that only shows up every now and then, and everybody else is four star. <laughs> Even better, we we got coffee mugs and belt buckles. It's a cool thing. You're cool. cool I, I, cool, I cool. would honorary CW five Tyson, um, sir. I want to thank you tremendously. Thank you. Uh, this is you just fulfilled one of my bucket lists. Talking to um, yourself, I, I have the highest respect for you and the work that you do. And thank, thank you for you. the shout out for that the the military book because a lot of sort of my deepest thinking about security, about the uh, the United States, the world, history, um, astrophysics, obviously, in, in particular, is all uh, stitched together there. And I have a co-author, Avis Lang, who's my longtime editor, who made sure, because there was so many moving parts, she made sure this stuff landed exactly as it needed to in the, in the interest and service of the reader. So, but, so thanks for giving that a shout out. Yeah. Oh, oh, and by the way, I didn't read the audio book, but you know who did? It's Angela Bassett's husband, Courtney Vance, who's also an actor. And he, you might remember him in a couple of roles, especially since you're in the military. He was the tech guy in the submarine in The Hunt for Red October. And he was the one that had the headphones on the whole time, just listening, decoding the pings and whatever sounds were there. And so but anyhow, he has a he has a very strong voice. And so he he agreed to just read the whole damn thing. So I said, there you go. Well, plus he's an actor, so he can he can feel the passages and put a little extra in that I wouldn't have been able to do. But well, I, I highly encourage you if you ever get uh, the opportunity to put your thoughts, especially as the world evolves and the political lines and everything shifts very interested in hearing your opinions and, and your ideas put on paper, whether it's a book or a podcast. Uh, always interested, sir. Thank you again for your time. A tremendous opportunity uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. War is evolving faster, I think, today than it ever has before in human history. Now, there is 
warfare unconstrained by geographic terrain and instead waged on a virtual or cyber battlefield. We are once again racing to the moon, and once we get there, then what? Science and technology push defense in different directions, in the direction of Taiwan, the direction of Ukraine, Afghanistan. Everything is tied together, from the GPS satellites used to make our munitions hit targets with deadly precision, to the very raw materials used to make the guidance chips on those missiles. Conflict and science continue to go hand in hand towards goals still unrealized. As we move outside the earth, flags in hand, ready to claim new lands, we will ultimately determine whether or not we can hate in space. Or maybe we need to figure out the moon situation first and then bring those lessons back down to earth. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I want to thank our very special guest, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is so gracious with this time. Pro tip, folks, never ask Dr. Tyson to describe who he is and what he does, because, wow, <laughs> he does a lot. Be sure to check out his podcast, Star Talk, and I won't even begin to go down the list of books he's written, but I will say, give Accessory to War a shot. It's a serious read, but like he said, it's a great window into the history of astrophysics and defense, as well as his perspectives on the future of that relationship. All of his books are great to read. I never get tired of a good uh, Dr. Tyson explanation of the world of our of current events. He's got this amazing explanation of how a professional sporting event was won by a team because the rotation of the earth gave him that little bit of an assist go check out all the great stuff from dr tyson and as always you can save 50 percent off your digital subscription to stars and stripes go to stripes.com use promo code podcast and save 50 percent on your digital subscription go to stripes.com today folks that does it for me i'm rod rodriguez and i will see you at the next episode This episode was brought to you by Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit helping build and donate homes to injured post 9-11 veterans. Visit hfotusa.org for more information.